and uh, so um, i think uh, dengue dengue is not new to all of you right always uh, we discuss about dengue and even i have done few lectures here but every day we had to discuss about dengue because uh, one of the killer disease uh, but uh, we see day to day practice now before this covid pandemic and uh, dengue was the main killer and uh, with covid uh, people pay their attention mainly to covid but now covid gone and now the dengue we had to live with dengue uh, throughout uh, our the, the life because uh, dengue won't uh, disappear like uh, covid so the today my task is to give some insight into dengue management so i don't want to discuss about the epidemiological factors and those thing but i directly go to the dengue management so they still most of the doctors when they see a full blood count they always uh, tell us the plate blood count is like this so that mean still our medical professionals also think dengue is a plate disease dengue is not a plate disease there are so many the condition so many infections so many other uh, condition which can cause thrombocytopenia so the those days when we were small the, the people thought dengue is due to the low plate and people die because of low plate i give one example one of my batch mates uh, the one girl the peers the boy pen was a third year that time we were first year students and third year medical student at no, no see, he was a registrar a medical registrar at uh, national hospital colombo and he got dengue uh, that is about 30 years ago right and uh, then uh, his platelet count dropped to uh, 20000 those days management was to give platelet transfusion so this the doctor this registrar got platelet transfusion and he developed the reaction to platelet transfusion and he died otherwise he is today concerned right so this is a true story so the that's why i am trying to tell all this when i present some lecture the dengue is not the plate disease the thrombocytopenia is a one page of dengue and it will guide us where we are the what stage of the disease but the the low plate doesn't kill the dengue patient so keep that in mind so dengue is a basically multi system disease to develop dengue there should be three factors that is uh, the virus should be there mosquito should be there and the susceptible human being should be there so the when you consider dengue management so the, that is basically we focus uh, towards the human the disease management but remember to the the, the the eradicate this disease we have to control the vector as well as the virus still we don't have effective antiviral tablet or medication and there are few uh, the candidate uh, vaccines available but they are not 100% effective so there are some vaccine uh, currently they are testing but one day if we get the vaccine that's a good thing but problem with vaccine development is dengue has four viruses four types of viruses so they when they develop vaccine that vaccine may be effective for dengue type 1 for 60% maybe type 2 for 40% like that no vaccine is available at the moment is 100% effective so the dengue management basically the the in sri lanka at present dengue management is very good so we are very proud to be uh, be physician who are managing dengue and our all the consultants uh, medical uh, consultants are you know they are very knowledgeable and they have very good experience in dengue management so not like 2017 2017 all were in panic you know the the hospitals were flooded with dengue patients right we had to acquire other hospital wards and everything so a lot of patient in 2017 but because of the awareness of program improvement of the monitoring and the fluid management now the dengue the death rate has come to very low level so the dengue management one of the most important thing is a monitoring so monitoring include the medical personnel as well as nursing officers so the monitoring is very important uh, because uh, there are no specific antibiotic no specific antiviral agent so it is a mainly the management based on monitoring of the patient 
and identify the physical signs which alarm us whether the patient is going to develop uh, dengue leaking and so on. This tiny instrument is very good uh, in dengue management with what we call as a micro centrifuge. This should be available in all cities. Unfortunately, now people spend a lot of money for the various high fi equipment at Peradeni. Currently, we don't have the micro tubes. We are fighting to get down the micro the micro tubes which you use in this centrifuge machine. But the, the you can see the, the priorities that our people give to dengue management. So when you are managing dengue, so these uh, the equipment, blood pressure monitoring, monitoring, uh, monitor, multi panel monitors are very important. When you are going to peripheral hospital, if you are going to manage your febrile patient or dengue patient, better to have at least the basic equipment you need to uh, monitor the dengue patient. So the monitoring is very important, as I said. So the fever charts, the still the, the our current day the medical medical graduates and young doctors they don't the the think these are very important. But remember the dengue chart, monitoring the temperature chart is very important. These are the normal input output chart, the dengue blue chart, the which is we are using for uncomplicated dengue patients, and the red chart which we use for a uh, dengue, the leak in patient basically. So those charts, just the marking is not enough, uh, the, not enough. You have to go to the charts and see what is happening with the patient and then uh, then and there you have to adjust the, the fluid regime for the patient. So what is the critical cause of dengue fever? So the, after three to 14 days of incubation period, patient develop fever. The, this fever is something like normal viral fever. So the, those days, this fever was called as breakbone fever. That means the, with this fever, people got severe back pain and aches and pain. So the so that's that's a typical dengue fever due to viremia, and uh, they can get headache, myalgia, back pain, and then get a high fever. And after about three, four, four, four five days of fever the fever start to settle. So some people will enter, the, the majority of the people, patients will enter the recovery phase. So they get a febrile phase and they go to recovery phase. And a small percentage of people enter into what we call as a critical phase, which lasts for about 48 hours. So what is happening in these uh, the three phases? So febrile phase is a high fever with those constitutional symptoms. And uh, during that time, uh, the main problem is uh, people will suffer because of high fever and aches and pains. So antipyretics, adequate hydration, but overhydration is not the recommended. And then uh, the, you can antiemetics if the patient is vomiting. Those are the main stay of management. Day one, day two, uh, uh, the beginning of day three, no need to come to the hospital, really speaking, unless patient is vomiting or really miserable. Otherwise, you can manage this patient at home. Make sure you are giving adequate amount of fluid, at least about 100 ml per hour. So you can continue, uh, if the patient is going to stay, you know, you can continue 100 ml per hour from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. In my practice, what I recommend at 10 o'clock in the night, you can have a the good glass of water, about 300 ml, and then you go to sleep. And uh, around 2 o'clock, like uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, you get up and have another full glass of water. That will cover the night time. So otherwise, when patients sleep at home, they don't get adequate fluid in the night time. So the first day, second day, and beginning of the third day, IV fluid is not the must. But if the patient is vomiting, yes, patient is not tolerating oral fluid, you have to give IV fluid. And then after the day three, beginning of the day three onwards, you have to be cautious, right? So because uh, the, the usually end of the third day or beginning of the fourth day, you expect some people going to leak in pace, what we call as a critical pace. During the, 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 this initial phase of the illness, yeah, I don't know whether you can see this point, uh, can't see, no? Yeah, can't see. Do you have point, please? Right. So the main problem during this period, if you uh, check the blood, it is a viremia. So the, that's a time the virus is circulating in the body. And towards the end of the, the fourth, the third or fourth day, 
the viremia will uh, go down, then you get the immune response via antibody formation. So if you want to do blood test during the first few days, so you can do NS1 antigen. Uh, if it is positive, it confirmed it is a dengue because we don't have other type of uh, dengue family virus, baby viruses in Sri Lanka. We assume with that we don't have other viruses. So NS1 positive in primary dengue, it can be positive about 98, 99%. But secondary dengue, it can be positive around 70%. So the NS1 negative doesn't exclude dengue, remember. So, but the, some people think my NS1 is negative, so no need to be, you know, the take necessary step. But when the, the NS1 is negative, but if you are thinking this is dengue, you have to be more cautious. You should not have false reassurance saying uh, my NS1 is negative. So the, if you want to do blood test, Yes, no harm doing the full blood count on the first day. It is a baseline. Then we know where are you. So then depending on that, after second day also, you can do another blood count. Remember, first, second days, the full blood count can be normal. So the, the so first, second days, this dengue also behave like other viruses or other kind of febrile illness. Some people we have observed the subtle shape of fever, where the fever settle and there may be a, the normal temperature and there may be a second fever in fact, the few, uh, the, maybe one day later. So that pattern also we have observed, but it is not a common type. So the, when you take the blood investigation, initial thing we uh, observe is leukopenia. The WBC count will start to fall first. The, which is uh, drawn as a purple line. Yeah. Then after that, only plater will start to drop toward the end of the second, third days. It will start to drop. And uh, so in some patients, we have observed rapid drop of the plater count. So that is an indication of the leaking, beginning of leaking phase. But remember, you don't see this typical pattern in almost every patient with leaking. So the, the, towards the end of the third or fourth day, most of the patient fever start to settle. Then some people will enter into critical phase or leaking phase, which lasts for 48 hours. What happened there? So during the critical phase, there is a transient leakage of uh, plasma from the vascular compartment. So this is due to the, the endothelial dysfunction, not the destruction. That's why it is only transient lasting for about 48 hours in the majority of the patient, but there may be uh, some leakers which the leaking phase little bit prolonged than the 48 hours, but majority the leaking stop within the 48 hours. This is the time we have to be very cautious. And if we can manage the patient during these 48 hours, I think most of the time patient will end to recovery phase. And uh, what are the problems you expect during the critical period? Because of the leaking, you get a depletion of intravascular compartment. So, for example, think about the, the, the water tank. You have opened the, the draining the, the, the tube and the, the, the supply is less. Then what will happen? The, the tank will become empty. So, same thing will happen if you don't adequately replace the leaking fluid. That's why it is important to know the, the, to do the, uh, the continuous observation by the parameters, we know where are we. So whether we are giving adequate fluid or whether we are not giving adequate fluid, by monitoring chart, we can get some idea. So then uh, the, during the critical phase, they can get some other complications. Uh, I will discuss that later. And uh, after the critical phase is managed, patient will enter into recovery phase. So the, the viral, uh, the initial period, as I said, the febrile phase, it lasts for about usually two to four days. But some people, it can be prolonged. For example, if the patient the fever continues, think about prolonged viremia. We are the, the even if you do the NS1, sometimes it can be positive day five, day six also, right? That says persistent viremia. But usually, dengue patient fever settled by four days. So if the fever continues, think about other possibilities of coexisting, other co-infection also, and uh, try to control temperature with antipyretics. Paracetamol is recommended. But we don't recommend any other non IDs. And uh, then uh, during this time, uh, sometimes people can get a delirium because of the high fever. They can become confused and uh, the ab abnormal behavior. So uh, keep, keep that also in mind when you are managing the patient during the febrile phase. If the patient, if somebody is there to look after your child or uh, your, your patient at home, first day, second day, 
or beginning of the third day, you can manage at all. No need to rush to the hospital. Even our hospital, the people come into hospital even the first day because of panic. So that's why the, we have to address those patients in and get down patient on the next day with another blood count. And uh, so the third day or not be careful, may need admission. So the, when the patient transit from the uh, febrile phase to critical phase, there are a few changes. That's what uh, we always teach our students as warning symptoms and warning signs. So when the patient is in the ward, day two, day three onwards, you have to carefully uh, check from the, with the patient whether they are having warning symptoms and warning signs. So during your ward round, ask about patient, how do you feel? How do you feel today? So if patient say, I am good, that's a good thing. If patient say, I'm not feeling good, that's not a good thing. And then ask some warning symptoms, for example, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and the postural dizziness. Those are very important physical symptoms and the symptoms you have to ask from the patient. And any mucosal bleeding, any difficulty in breathing, those are the important things you have to ask during the during your ward round. Then you examine the patient, look at the patient, see whether they're well looking or ill looking today. So patient ill looking or well looking. And then feel the hand and feel the pulse, CRFT, capital repeating time, and then the blood pressure, and then check the abdomen for a tender abdomen or tender tight hypochondria. The process of or detecting the pre-fluid in ward patient is too late. So that means you miss something. So the, when you are doing the daily ward round, maybe you have to do the daily twice ward round or night ward round also when there are a lot of dengue patients because you have to expect development of the new physical symptoms and signs. So today morning ward round will be totally different from tomorrow morning ward round. So the, what is the importance of abdominal pain? Even the first day, they can get abdominal pain, but that is not due to leaking. So if the patient develops abdominal pain after day three onwards, you have to be cautious. So abdominal pain could be the main complaint of the child or a patient, and they say it is like gastritis or aching type of pain. So this abdominal pain may be the signs of leaking. So it will be the early signs of leaking. Don't miss this important physical campaign or this campaign of physical sign. And uh, so the, it is a sign of leaking. Again, in a shock patient also, you can get abdominal pain. But the day three onwards, if they are complaining abdominal pain, suspect whether the patient is going to leak it. The vomiting also another important physical symptom. The warning symptom you, have, you should uh, not miss. And that also one of the symptoms uh, where patients develop when they are starting leaking. And uh, the, when the fever settling after three day, day four, like usually when fever settling, we feel better. That's what happens. Usually we feel better. Your appetite is improving. You like to sit on a bed. You like to read or watch television, right? But if the, the patient is not improving, sitting or lie, sleeping most of the time in, uh, without fever also, then you suspect when the patient is leaking. The, generally, we expect when the fever cell patient should improve, if they're not improving, always suspect whether patient is having leaking. The mucosal bleeding, it could be gum bleeding or the menstrual bleeding. Again, think about uh, the, the, whether the patient is getting some kind of the complication. So the, when you do the blood counts, the, as I said, initial thing to go down the WBC, then the platelet, and uh, the, those are the important uh, markers that will guide us what stage of the disease. And rapid drop of the platelet is an early indication of patient is going to leaking. And uh, don't forget to do the SGPT OD. I think that I generally the, the do for a patient with uh, uh, dengue, the, every other day I will check the uh, platelet, the STPTOT, that's something the, the without your notice can go up. So the full blood count daily you have to do, maybe be, twice a day. And uh, so the, always think about doing STPTOT at least every other day. If it is high, you can continue uh, daily monitoring because liver involvement is fairly common in dengue. And some people get very abnormally high STPT and the liver derangement. The we have observed the, the nowadays, the people dying uh, from the dengue mostly due to, not due to leaking, mostly due to liver involvement. So that's why it is good 
practice to do the, the continuous monitoring the liver functions also. So the I showed you the initially I showed you the the microcentrifuge. That's a very important instrument that should install in your ward, and uh, by that you can uh, get the report within five minutes. You know, from the patient, uh, take the blood into the capillary tube, and you get the report. That is very useful you to adjust the pre triage. But if you send in the full blood count to the laboratory, it will take maybe two two hours at least to get the report. But make sure your microcentrifuge in the ward is working. So the when patient enter into the critical phase, how do you manage? So the why critical phase due to increased vascular permeability, and as a result of that, increase extra vasculation of vasculation of the plasma. So the plasma leakage is a whole mark of a critical phase. So you have to replace this leaking amount of fluid with the appropriate fluid. What is the common appropriate fluid you are using is histamine. The normal saline should be available in your ward, and in some stances we use the uh, dextra. But I heard recently now hetastat is not in our formulary. You know, so it is going to be out of out, 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 It is it is not in using in future, and so the main thing we are having is a poly, as a colloid is a dextra. So the the main tweet we are using is a normal saline, and you should, you have to make sure your ward is having adequate amount of the dextran also. So if you don't adequately replace with the appropriate fluid, patient can get the, the complication like that they can go into shock. Another question is, do people with uh, uh, dengue, all the patients with the dengue enter into the critical phase? Answer is no. Even though some enter into the critical phase, all are not going to shock also. Because we have observed the large number of the patients going to enter into critical phase are mild leakers. Just presence of the leaking or just rising of the, the, the hematocrit doesn't indicate patient is in critical stage. Only the small percentage of the leakers will only go into the shock and life-threatening complications. So the now new classification, you have read definitely the severe dengue, the term called severe dengue. So who are the category of people we consider as a severe dengue? The one is a people with a severe plasma leakage, what we call as a dengue hemorrhagic fever. Second category is a people with a severe bleeding. Other category is a severe organ impairment. So we mainly focus our attention to severe plasma leakage or dengue hemorrhagic fever, where our main stream of management is a pre replacement. But there are other category of the people, for example, severe bleeders, the, sometimes their bleeding is not related to dengue hemorrhagic fever. So even without leaking, they can get the massive bleeding, especially the in, bleeding into intestine, is the intestine bleeding into the palmar, the lungs. So, and the, their outcome also not very good. And uh, third category, the severe organ impairment, mainly the liver. In addition to that, they can get the heart involvement, kidney involvement, and the brain involvement. Those are discussed as a expanded dengue syndrome also. So the, the our experience, as I mentioned, the severe liver involvement carries high, high percentage of morbidity. So the, the number one category, severe plasma leakage, as I said, the main issue is increased plasma leakage. So if we don't match this plasma leakage with appropriate fluid, they will go into the shock. And if the shock is not managed, they will end up with cardiac arrest and death. Severe bleeders, I will give one example. The, when I reported Peradini as a consultant uh, in 2013, one of our uh, the canting owner the, at Candy, you know, Candy, Candy doctor's canting owner's son was admitted to the Peradini. Basically, that child, uh, about 14 years old child, patient from uh, Kundasale, and uh, the patient had a fever, about three, three days fever. The canteen owner and the mother come into canteen, and the child was with the uh, grandmother. So the doctor was, uh, patient was seen by local doctor, and morning they have done the blood count, and uh, till evening, the, till the patient, parents go, uh, go they didn't review this blood count with the doctor. And uh, when 
parents returning home, patient was very ill and brought to Kandy, the HDU, the PCU. And uh, because they decided to send to the ICU, patient was transferred to Peradini ICU, they, where I went and so. The, the well-built child, the, the patient had the features of leaking plus massive bleeding. Bleeding from where? Gastrointestinal tract. Patient had a red color, massive bleeding, the copious amount of blood, and we had to give massive transfusion, and we couldn't stop the bleeding. And uh, red cell tax scan also done for the patient, and uh, it shows the oozing from whole gut. So there's no ulcer in this kind of patient. That's a oozy. So where you can't do anything. Ultimately, that child died. Right? So the remember, so the, the massive bleeding can get with uh, the, the DHF, the dengue hemorrhagic fever, and that can be seen without the, the without leaking. So I will give you another example. The this man work in Colombo. And a uh, young man about uh, 30 years old from uh, now, uh, sorry, the Rikilagas And the uh, patient was admitted to our ward. Uh, basically, patient is not feeling well. Anyhow, he came to the ward. And when examined, patient was quite okay. And uh, within half an hour, patient became breathless, suddenly breathless, right? So then, uh, when examined, examined, there were some capitation. Saturation is was okay. We quickly arranged the in-node X-ray. I was present that time also with the patient. We took the X-ray. X-ray shows something like consolidation on your right chest. And rapidly patient desaturated. Move to the ICU. The, the initially non-invasive ventilation, but then they had to intubate. And uh, then patient uh, the developed arts-like picture and died. Post-mortem came as Massive pulmonary hemorrhage. So those are the, the that patient didn't have any leaking features, right? So remember, so if your patient become very distressed or the dyspneic or desaturated without any leaking feature, think about possibility of pulmonary hemorrhage, right? Uh, the common sites are the our experience, the GI tract and the and the pulmonary hemorrhage, right? So the the, the liver involvement is severe when the SGPT OT level more than 1000. So the, then you have to do the other liver function and keep eye on the patient whether the patient is going to dengue acute liver injury, which has a high mortality rate. And uh, so the, then uh, other organ, as I said, uh, the kidney can involve. Some patients we have observed polyuria during this uh, initial period of dengue, dengue fever. That also, that is not a renal impairment. That's another observation we have made. But acute kidney injury also we have observed in dengue patient. And the cardiac involvement also not a common thing. So you should not compromise your fluid management thinking there is a myocarditis. Because myocarditis is not a common problem in dengue. So some people think when there is a T inversion or something, patient is a myocarditis, myocarditis and reduce the fluid the regime. But myocarditis is, is described, but not a common thing. Because of that, you should not uh, hinder your fluid management for the patient. So when you are managing the dengue shock patient, if you don't properly manage the patient, they will go into compensated shock. With that time, patient conscious level is maintaining, and their blood pressure is either normal or a little bit the elevated diastolic blood pressure. If you don't manage this compensated shock, they will go into decompensated shock where the, their systolic and diastolic blood pressure drop. And if you don't manage this properly, they will go to cardiac uh, arrest and they, they die. So during the dengue management, remember, there are some other diseases commonly we see in our day-to-day -day practice which can mimic dengue syndrome. So flu-like illnesses, viral, viral infection, some acute abdomen, sometimes dengue patients end up with uh, surgical load. Remember, if patient coming with a fever as a first symptom, then the abdominal pain is more like a medical. If the abdominal pain comes first, then you develop fever, it can be a surgical. So remember that thing when you are working in the OPD, especially if the patient develop fever first, then develop the abdominal pain, it is more likely medical case. And these are the, some other differential diagnoses you can think about uh, dengue patient when you are managing 
dengue. So the viral infection, bacterial infection, and uh, parasitic, and uh, the diarrheal illness, even dengue can present like a diarrhea, acute abdominal condition, like that. There are so many differential diagnoses. Even we have reported some dengue with co-infection, uh, which is fairly common in our setup. So the, now people will ask, doctor, can I stay at home uh, during my dengue? So that's a difficult uh, question sometimes ans to answer, but uh, you know, the, when the patient is very well looking, but you can tell, as I said initially, first two, three days, you can stay at home, but toward the end of the third day, you are be cautious, right? Without medical attention, you should not keep your child at home. But our OPD settings are not developed as such. We are to review the patient daily basis. So those are the things that we can think about when you are managing dengue patients. Otherwise, we get unnecessary admission, right? And uh, always uh, discourage them to use other drugs apart from paracetamol. Steroids should, steroids should be avoided. And uh, antibiotic also, no need to do antibiotic in dengue management unless you're suspecting there's some co uh, infection with leptospirosis or some other thing. Otherwise, antibiotic should not give for a dengue patient uh, during the febrile phase. Why steroid should not give to dengue? There are some school of th thinking the steroid can be used in dengue patients. There are some trials done with the methylprednisolone, but even our guideline or Sri Lankan guideline or WHO guideline doesn't recommend steroid in dengue patients. I follow those guidelines, so I don't use steroid. Right? So the, the, the so some argue, you know, even I think, why can't we give, give steroid? Now, the, when you think about the pathophysiology of the dengue, it is mainly due to cytokine storm. There are so many cytokines, the interleukins and those cytokines. And when you consider some diseases like rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, right? Those diseases also main problem is cytokines. So we use steroid in those uh, diseases. Why can't we use in dengue? Right? Still, we don't have enough trial evidence. And those are the areas we can investigate and uh, see whether we can use steroid in dengue. People against uh, steroid use in dengue, they have shown that it increases the, the, the risk of bleeding. So when you are using uh, the steroid, it increases the risk of bleeding. So that's the main argument. They say not to use uh, steroid in dengue. But when you argue cytokines can be you know, controlled with steroid, yes, still there is a place. But this is the area, gray area. At the moment, our Sri Lankan guideline or WHO doesn't recommend steroid in dengue management. But you may see some instances, some consultants using, but no enough evidence. So the, then uh, the patient, uh, the usual group A, basically who are managing at home. The group B is the patient we are taking to the hospital, especially the even the febrile patient with uh, the coexisting disease like diabetes mellitus, renal failure, pregnant, infant, elderly, and people who don't have anyone, they are to look after them. The, the guideline recommend to admit those patients to hospital because uh, we have to keep eye on them. And uh, then due, after admitting, you have to continuously monitor the patients. And uh, then uh, when the, the patient is showing the signs and symptoms of uh, leaking, you manage accordingly. For example, suppose shock patient is coming to your emergency department, the shock patient. So the, when the dengue is prevalent, you can think this is a dengue patient, dengue shock. But there are some other causes like sepsis can cause shock, cardiogenic shock. You know, there are different causes of shock. So you have to establish whether this is a dengue shock or some other shock. The, what is the easiest way to establish dengue shock is a do PCV. So the PCV, if the PCV is high, 50 or above, that more towards the dengue shock, where you have to give fluid boluses, right? So suppose your patient is coming to shock, the PCV is 51, so the patient conscious, blood pressure is, we'll say, 100 by 70. So the, the where you give, the boluses, right? So the, then you can give about uh, high rate boluses, for example, five to 10 ml per kilogram uh, rate. So you give the boluses and uh, then you start the resuscitation. And after first bolus of the fluid, we'll say patient is not responding. Still the PCV high. And then what's the next step? 
you have to repeat the another bolus. That's a guideline, right? And uh, so the, you repeat the bolus, and if the patient is responding, you gradually tail off them to it, uh, the regime. And uh, for example, a patient is not responding, what should you do? Do the bedside PC, the PCV, hematocrit. If the hematocrit is high, patient is not responding, that means patient leaking is the main problem. So you have already given two bolus of uh, crystalloid, then your next fluid should be the, the colloid, where you use the dextran. So you try dextran, the bolus, and recheck the PCV and reassess the clinically. If the patient improving, PC coming down, right, you then follow the, the tail of fluid regime. When you do the PCV, PCV low, PCV low, patient is still in shock. Then you have to suspect whether the patient is having bleeding. This bleeding can be occult bleeding. As I said earlier, it could be intra the intestinal bleeding or even intrapulmonary bleeding, where it is not evidence. Just see whether the patient is having malina or whether the patient is having any lung signs, then you can think about concealed bleeding. With the PCV low shock patient, where you suspect as a dengue shock, the, the next to it is what? Blood transfusion. So we are, that's the place where we use blood transfusion in patient with shock patient, dengue shock patient with low PCV. Right. So in summary, so when you are managing dengue patient, the, the patient stable, just a peptide patient, the first, second days you can definitely manage at home, third day onwards you have to be cautious. Then the second category is a dengue, the shock patient, compensated shock patient, again you give the fluid boluses and review the fluid regime with the PCV. Third category is uh, the, the decompensated shock patient, again you give the, the high rate of fluid and uh, decide your fluid regime according to the PCV. So how do you decide the fluid? This is the formula you have to decide the fluid. This is the fluid amount you are going to give for the 48 uh, hours. That's a two days of the dengue hemorrhagic fever. So calculation is by this formula, M plus 5%. I think this is given in our dengue guideline also. So you have to calculate this amount for a patient. If the patient come into you with shock, then you assume patient is patient has passed 24 hours of dengue hemorrhagic fever. Then you can use this total fluid quota for the next four, two, 24 hours, right? Where you start with the, the boluses and gradually tailing off the fluid. Suppose your patient in the ward, you uh, admitted on the second day, you have given some amount of fluid and patient showing the features of leaking and you decide ah, now this patient is having leaking. Then you calculate this fluid amount for the his 48 hours the for the next 48 hours and you give this to it in a distribution manner right if patient is not responding to your fluid bolus what is the next step so you have to suspect other possible causes like massive plasma leakage concealed hemorrhage hypocalcemia hypoglycemia hyponatremia acidosis right those are the other things you have to think if your patient is not responding to your fluid regime so with that, uh, we try to go to one or two case scenarios. So this is a 20 years old uh, patient coming with the third day of the illness and a fever for three days associated with a headache, generalized muscle leg, poor appetite, nausea and dizziness. What are the differential diagnoses? Could be viral fever, dengue fever and other common infection we see, leptospirosis, and uh, uh, what is, if the patient is a runny nose, coriza, influenza, COVID, those are the differential diagnoses, right? And no vomiting or diarrhea, no reason, uh, any jungle tracking, no swimming or any, any other activities. Examination, blood pressure is normal, pulse normal, respiration normal, febrile, warm peripheries, throat clear, 
no rashes, cardiovascular, those are normal. Counts, uh, hemoglobin normal, PCV 41. The, this is a 23 years old patient. 41 is not very abnormal. It, you know, the female 38 to 40, 42 is okay, like, right? So the question asks, does this look like dengue possible? Not only dengue, as I said, you can consider other differential diagnosis. So what are the other things on the third day you are going to ask from the patient? As I said, warning symptoms and signs. Those are the important things you have to ask. So you ask about the abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, postural dizziness, any bleeding, the mucosal bleeding. And then you examine the signs. What are the signs? The basically, you have to ask, uh, check the blood pressure, pulse, abdomen. Those are the important things you have to check. And uh, this patient, how do we manage? Basically, the, if the patient can take by mouth, as I said, you can encourage them to take 100 ml power during 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And 10 p.m. you can take about uh, 300 to 400 ml step uh, the amount. Then after two, three hours, you take another 300 ml. And from the tomorrow, again, you start the oral intake. And uh, then... So as I said, this could be dengue, undifferentiated fever. So uh, now this patient, you, you plan to manage at home. So as I said, if there are indications, you can think about admitting. So the, they, they have done some CT blood sample, day three, uh, hemoglobin 13.5, HCT 41. Day four, it has dropped to 37. Day three is the day we, the, we had an encounter with the patient where we advised them to take adequate amount of fluid. So why this drop of uh, PCV on the day three, day four? Adequate hydration because patient was with dehydration. After adequate hydration, patient, uh, the hemodeplate uh, now 37, and it is stable throughout the rest of the days, right? So this is a very simple management of the dengue patient, uh, which is very common. So always uh, you can encourage your patient, manage at home, but make sure you follow up this patient, right? Now our Sri Lanka, there is a national, I think, uh, health support system also for the dengue patient where they can, uh, the, uh, ask their queries from the health, Ministry of Health. That's a, that's a good hotline system. So the, remember, all the patients with the dengue, don't encourage them to come to the hospital, but make sure if the patient is having any warning symptom or signs, you have to admit those patients. If the patient is not reliable, you can't rely on them, the, then better to admit because otherwise they will think doctor asks us to stay at home. So that's a problem. So make sure if the patient is very sensible, family is sensible, you can advise first, second, third day they can stay, but fourth day onwards they have to be cautious. So the case two, the 11 years old boy, 35 kilogram, fever for four days. So that's the time we have to be cautious. End of third day, fourth day, we have to be cautious. Severe body ache, lethargy, unable to walk and poor oral intake, nausea, vomit. So this is a patient who can't stay at home because they are not taking adequate amount of fluid. And patient is having abdominal pain. That's a warning symptom. And uh, the, they are, uh, the neighborhood, there are people with dengue. So the temperature is febrile, blood pressure is okay, pulse 90, saturation 97, his lethargy, coated tongue, so dehydrated patient. Capillary refilling less than two, that's still good. Warm extremities, tender right hypochondrium. So there, there was a warning symptom, there's a warning sign, tender hypochondrium, and a patient is having abdominal pain. And investigation, hemodokit is 47, 43, WBC leukopenia, and the plate at low. Uh, so the, they are working diagnosis, dengue fever. So that, that's a day three, day four. When day five, the, the still the temperature is there and the PCV has dropped to 41. So that may be the after hydration. And uh, while patient is on hydration on the day five, the, the colored area, you can see the PCV is going up 44. What are the possibilities? Right? So now PCV rising in spite of my fluid management. One thing is we are not giving adequate amount of fluid to match the leaking, ongoing leaking, right? 
So the patient seems to be leaking because in spite of treat replacement, PCV is going up. Remember, when you read our the national guideline, it says 20% rise of the PCV. That is for a patient who didn't get any replacement. But when you are giving the pre-treat replacement, don't expect 20% right of rise of PCV. If the tendency is rising, the PCV, that means there is an ongoing leaking. The amount of treat we are giving is not that great, right? So the here, what we have to understand is the amount of treat we are giving is not adequate. The blood pressure 100 by 70. And on the day six, toward day six, we can see PCV has gone up to 51. So, so the, the rapid rise of PCV, right? What does it indicate? That indicate now this patient is not managing properly, right? So the, there is some failure somewhere, right? So, so you you may come across this kind of scenarios. So the whenever you are managing dengue patient in the ward, suspected leaking patient, always monitor with PCV. That's the best investigation. Plus clinical assessment. Once you confirm with the ultrasound, there is a leaking, no need to do the serial ultrasound. That also we have observed, you know, daily don't do ultrasound to assess the amount of fluid. That's not, not relevant in dengue management. Right? So what you have to do, check the PCV, try to bring the PCV down, and uh, the, 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 that will help to recover the patient. Right. Because of the time factor, I think I will uh, stop here and uh, I can answer any question if you want to ask.